All right, kind of a small crowd today, but uh, welcome to, for tonight. So uh, glad everybody can make it. Uh, of course, both, most of you know me, Richard Vondro, president of North Keepers Club. Vanessa Vondro back in there is our club queen. And tonight, Eric Falmouth, Falmouth, he's our new secretary. So he stepped up and uh, he's gonna, him, Madison and him are gonna work together. I'm sure there's some things they gotta work out yet, but uh, Madison said she's gonna kinda stay on the page too yet because she likes to see the page and she might throw something out there too yet. So, but Eric's gonna take over for us. So, uh, thanks Eric. So, uh, everybody got a chance to sign up for door prize and raffle drawings. Uh, we have a screen bottom board back there tonight for our door prize. So. Uh, get a chance to sign up. Uh, the door prize uh, we have for the club here kind of helps offset the cost of not having membership dues. So uh, anything we can do for that part of it uh, kind of helps, uh, helps that cost. Our door prize is over there. Uh, you can bring anything you want. You see some of the stuff is not bee related, but uh, kind of something that you might be around and something you might be interested in. So. Anybody can bring something for that. So, a uh, couple events coming up here. Uh, first of all, coming here uh, Mar Saturday, March 23rd, SEBA, uh, which is Central Iowa Beekeepers Association, is having their winter seminar. Uh, in our club registration and club paper, Madison posted out there. That's the paper, it's out there, the registration form. They have a lot of good speakers coming down there. It's going to be a full day of. Uh, uh, information down there, I have a lunch down there and everything too. So uh, it's a registration fee is $40 a person. If you're a SEBA member, it's 35, 20 for students. So uh, if you're interested in going down, I said it's March 23rd, Saturday. So uh, they do a really good job down there for, for their winter seminars and they do a couple of them down there. So uh, very good, very nice to, to go down there and listen to their stuff, so. Uh, after that, we have Iowa Honey Bee Day. Uh, Iowa Honey Producers Association puts on Iowa Honey Bee Day. Uh, it's Wednesday, March 27th. That's down in the Rotunda at the uh, Iowa State Capitol. Down there, we get to hang around with all legislative people down there and, and talk about our issues that we have and, and concerns and stuff like that. Uh, it's gonna start, we start setting up at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, it runs from about seven to 10 as, as we have. And the rotunda is like the second floor. We have pretty much the whole rotunda. So we can, we really spread out and have a good display down there. So uh, I'm sure I'll be going down. Vanessa will probably be going down. So if anybody else is interested in going down, maybe we can hook up and uh, not everybody has to drive. We can kind of carpool down a little bit if we had to. So, but uh, it gets to be a longer day. And then uh, after about 10 o'clock or so, they are trying to schedule a couple of tours. Uh, we usually go up to the agriculture department main office for one tour usually. And a couple years ago, they got to tour more of the Capitol, actually went up into the dome too. So I know they're talking about trying to get that tour again. So you can get up and pretty high up in a dome up there. So not all the way to the peak, but pretty high. So uh, kind of a fun day down there. It could be a long day, but it's a fun day. So. <clears throat> Uh, I said anybody can go down to that. So uh, he said if you want a carpool, just get a hold of me and we can see if we can get a few people, people to go down. So, all right. Uh, we have our auction April 27th down at Pat and Peggy's, down at PP Honey and Goodell. So uh, if you have anything that you need to sell, uh, bee related or chicken related, so. Uh, if you got stuff, get a hold of Pat, and it's a consigner fee of 10% before April 1st, and after April 1st, it's 15% consigner fee. So, so if you got something that you want to get sold on the auction, uh, just get a hold of Pat. So, uh, down there, we also can use uh, some people to help out. <clears throat> we usually got people bringing stuff in. We got to move stuff around uh, when the auction is hold stuff up, carry it to people that have bought it and stuff like that. So we can use a few people as volunteers to help out too. If anybody's willing to help out, just get a hold of Pat or I. Uh, so we know you're coming and so we didn't get, get an idea what's going on. So 
Uh, and then we have our Springfield Day again, and that's May 18th. That'll be a Saturday. <clears throat> Instead of having our meeting, normal meeting of Tuesday, May 14th, we'll be doing the Springfield Day at Pat and Peggy's again down there for May 18th. Kind of the same as we've done before. Uh, this year we're doing something a little different. We're not doing like mite treatments and, and diseases on bees. We're doing uh, a queen rearing kind of a class a little bit uh, to take off in the shop. We're pretty much in the shop. We're going to do some grafting. So you get a chance to graft if you want. But it's more to how to raise queens for hobbyists. There's different ways of raising queens, not grafting. So we're doing that, uh, doing a class on that. That's going to be in the morning. I got a gal that I'm working on, see if she's going to come up and help out and be another speaker. And she's grafted before, but uh, she hasn't got back to me yet of if she can make it. But uh, we're trying to have two people there at least that have grafted. So when we set up our grafting stations, there's a couple of people that knows what's going on. And then, then we'll have our potluck lunch. And then in the afternoon, we'll go back out to the beehives like we've done other years. We'll do a hive inspection, a mite check, and splits. So that's our afternoon part of it when we're out at the beehive. So uh, that seemed to go pretty good. Everybody enjoys a, a good day down there. Uh, there's the paper for that is in our uh, email and also on our Facebook. So <coughs> to sign up for that one. And you'll just send your uh, checks and stuff to, to me for that one. So, uh, okay. And then we also have <coughs> NIAC. Uh, you know, Pat does a beginning beekeeping class, <coughs> excuse me, at NIAC in February, but <coughs> we've also done a, a different, a summer class. This one's changed a little bit. It's a four-part class instead of an eight-part class we had before. Uh, $25 each session, or it's $89 for the, the whole four, four days. So it starts out in May 4th, then we're at May 25th. Uh, May 4th, we're starting out with nukes and packages. May 25th, we have a hive inspection. And then we're going to honey production. That's going to be a, uh, July 20th. I think we're going to be doing that at your, your place on that one, aren't you, Pat? Yep. So, and then the last one would be preparing for winter. That would be September 14th. So, uh, it's not quite as long as we, done, we did one before. But uh, I think we can pretty well cover everything that we've done before, just in four-part session this time. So, and uh, I have a couple papers back there, and there's a phone number here to register to call. Uh, there's a phone number here. It's a NIAX number. You got to register through NIAX for that. So, if you got any information or any questions on it, just get a hold of me and and or pick up a flyer, and and I'll have uh, Eric. I'll have you put this on our our Facebook page too. So. So it'll be out there. So, okay. Does anybody have anything else they got to bring up at this time? Okay. Our speaker tonight is Connor. He's from the DNR office, Department of Conservation. Is it? Yeah, I work with a lot of offices. Okay. I work with the DNR and the USDA I'm all over the place, but I'll, I'll explain more about that okay. shortly. All right, I'll let you take over. Sure. All right, so I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Thank you for showing up. I know it's hard to be inside on a night like this, but I'm gonna try to uh, give you a good presentation anyway and try to take your mind off of being outdoors. So my name is Connor. I am a private lands wildlife biologist and I'm based out of, I work out of Garner a lot. However, today I worked in Mason City, work in Northwood, work in Thompson. So I'm all over the four county area up here and I live in Clear Lake, and I've been working at this job for the last year and a half or so. So I often work with the DNR, NRCS, um, FSA, a lot of different state and federal programs. So it's, uh, it's a good mixed bag. It's a lot of fun for me. And uh, I don't know a ton about bees, but I know a few things about getting ground ready for preparing for bees and other pollinators. We often get questions in our offices um, from producers that come in inquiring about what they can do to maximize their wildflowers or their grasses and really what they can do to prepare their ground. So I'm not uh, too unfamiliar with 
talking to people about this topic. And tonight I prepared a presentation. I got 60 slides. We'll see how quickly I can get through them, but try to go nice and slow. And I'm going to be bouncing around all over the place. And if at any point you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and um, I'll be happy to answer that in the middle of the presentation, or you can save it to the end. But like I said, I'm going to be bouncing around all over the place. So might, uh, there's a lot of topics I'll cover. You may forget the question, so don't, uh, don't be afraid to interrupt. Happy to answer questions. So anyway, yes, like I said, I don't know a ton about bees. I enjoy birds a lot. They're kind of my specialty, so I'm going to try not to be too distracted looking at those turkeys out there. And without further ado, we can go ahead and talk about preparing ground for wildflower seeding. Can you turn it up just a little bit? Sure. Well, it's not, no, it's, it's not a mic. It's not a... Well, I'll turn I'll turn my voice up a little bit then. <laughs> okay, I'll turn my voice up. No worries. <laughs> okay, so the first step to preparing your ground for wildflower seeding, you need to kind of assess what you have, and you need to determine how you're going to convert that ground into a space that can accommodate wildflowers. So, of course, the goal with planting wildflowers and really any flower is people may have a bunch of different goals, but I imagine the goal of anyone in this room is to attract their bees and give their pollinators, their bees, somewhere for them to forage and create food. So a lot of people may have just a little chunk of their lawn that they may want to turn into a pollinator habitat. We can work with that. But in my offices, we often have farmers, other producers that'll come in and they will want to transform one of their fields or a part of their field into pollinator habitat and we work with them and develop plans to make that happen. There's various programs that can be used to accomplish turning a field into a large tract of wildflowers and we're going to talk about that a little bit later but just know that there are options and it's even possible to transform a tract of woodland into um, a wildflower habitat it may not be what most people think of when they picture like a meadow of wildflowers, but it works nonetheless. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But like I said, the first step to preparing your ground is just assessing what you have and going from there. Okay, and what you have to do when you wanna transform your ground into a good spot for wildflowers is you first have to kill any existing vegetation um, it's, a, you know, planting wildflowers is not an easy process, I'll just be honest, because people have to be committed for the long run. It takes several years to establish a good wildflower bed, and you need to constantly maintain and assess what you have and see how the seeds are taking. So the first step when you want to plant wildflowers is to just kill the existing vegetation. If it's a lawn, you can kill the turf or the grass. If it's uh, an agricultural field, then you are kind of set well after you harvest whatever grain or other commodity you had in that field because you're just kind of left with soil and you can work with that pretty easily. So like I said, in my offices, that's a lot of time what people come in wanting to do. So they kind of have it a little bit easier than someone, say, that wanted to transform part of their lawn into a wildflower habitat. It's a little bit more difficult, but I will talk about how people can go about getting that done. And the thing about when you want to transform part of your lawn into wildflower habitat, grasses are very competitive. So what you seed your lawn with, it's a lot of times not a native species. It's very competitive and it can, in almost any circumstance, outcompete the wildflowers. That's why you have to kill it beforehand when you want to establish wildflowers. You can't just sprinkle seeds in your lawn and hope that they'll take because that's just simply not going to work. So I'll talk about what we can do to prepare a lawn, for instance. And kind of like I mentioned earlier, you have to be in it for the long haul when you want to prepare a place for wildflowers. It's not a simple year process or it's not as simple as planting the seeds and letting it go. Like I mentioned, you just have to keep maintaining the property and you have to make it a hospitable environment for your wildflowers. So it's a matter that takes patience. And it, like I said, you can't just plant the seeds and expect results. And realistically, it will take a few years. 
Later in the presentation, I kind of lay out a 10-year plan that people can follow. That's just a general guideline. We'll get to that, but expect to commit a decent chunk of time into doing this. But the rewards can be very satisfying, so just keep that in mind. I have a question. Sure. What do you consider wild? Sure. So a lot of times um, when people come into my office, they want native wildflowers. So stuff that would historically been in the state of Iowa and the prairies and the grasslands. That's a lot of times what I work with. And when I say wildflowers, a lot of times I'm talking about native species. Of course, you can plant non-native species and bees will like them just fine. However, with the work that I do, I usually recommend the native species just because they're used to living in this Iowa climate and environment, so they have a leg up in that regard. Some of the non-native species can certainly be competitive and they can take well. However, they might get a little bit too competitive and then they could end up being dominant in your wildflower planting. So when I work with people, we work with our native species. I'll give some examples later, but you can think of stuff like uh, wild bergamot, golden alexanders, um, coneflowers, there's a lot of good choices and in our, when we work with producers in my offices, we often write them a seed plan and the seed plan will contain a bunch of native flowers and native grasses. Um, and it can be quite, ex quite an extensive list depending on what practice someone does, but there's easily several dozen, maybe upwards of 30 or 40 species that we put in our seedings for uh, people that we help in my offices. So when I talk about wildflowers, I'm usually referring to native species, although non-native species can work as well. They're just uh, maybe not quite as adapted to the Iowa climate. Did that answer your question? Okay. So when you wanna prepare a site, you can go a few different routes, but here I have a comparison of the chemical versus the mechanical route. There's pros and cons to each, of course. Um, for instance, a mechanical, preparation of a site, it's usually a lower investment of money, may, maybe not a lower investment of time, it's usually more affordable for a landowner. And of course, I'm sure this is of interest to people in this room, it's free of insecticides, pesticides. Um, obviously, we try to minimize those often as, as much as we can. Um, and when you go the chemical route, it often involves uh, spraying some sort of pesticide or herbicide and that may have negative effects on pollinators or other native species. So um, that's just something to consider when you're weighing the two options. Um, and like I said, it can be a little more time intensive to do the mechanical site preparation and it may not be as effective um, as spraying some sort of herbicide on your ground and then the pros of a chemical treatment, like I said, it's efficient and it's effective, um, but it can be expensive and it can have some detrimental effects to pollinators. So for those reasons, I mean, it's when people come into my offices, I can't really steer them one way or the other. Um, if I were to do it, I try to avoid pesticides and whatnot as much as I can. So. I would probably go the mechanical route, but just be prepared. If you do go that route, it'll probably take a little more time than the mechanical route, but I'll give some examples here in the, in the next slides. Okay, so if you want to get a lawn ready, for instance, just a small tract of your lawn to seed wildflowers, then what you can do is after the grass greens up in the spring, you can go ahead and mow it really short a couple of times. Go ahead and set your mower settings to about as short as you possibly can get, and then go over it um, once, let it come back up, and you can go over it again if you want to, but one time as well would suffice if that's all you have the time for. Um, and you'll probably also want to remove the excess grass clippings if there are a bunch of them or if your mower doesn't bag them up. Uh, this just helps to create a uniform surface, and we'll talk about that in the following slides, why that's important. Um, for this, you don't want to till the soil because again, you want a uniform surface and we'll talk about tilling later, but for now, just if you're gonna do this method, the mowing method, just mow once or twice in the spring. And we're gonna talk about smothering lawns and what that entails. This is just one of the methods that you can use to 
get the site ready for wildflowers and kill off the grass. Um, basically smothering entails, uh, cutting off the sunlight from grasses, and of course plants need photosynthesis to survive. So if they're deprived of that, then they can't function, and that is the idea behind smothering a lawn. So you'll want to, in order to smother effectively, you're gonna to wanna to cover that lawn, the piece of ground that you wanna put wildflowers in, you're gonna cover it with something. You can use burlap, you can use some sort of a large plastic sheet, but you're gonna to wanna to bury the edges into the ground so it's um, not uh, allowing any air to go in. You're gonna to wanna to weigh down the edges as well, like the sides of it, with some sort of heavier material like a rock or, um, or a brick or something like that. And this just ensures that, like I said, no air gets in and ensures it stays covered for a few months, which is what it's gonna to take to effectively smother the lawn and kill the grasses so you can then go in and plant the seeds for the wildflowers. And just quickly going over the why again, we do this because it cuts off the photosynthesis. This will kill the grass. It'll take a few months, but if you give it time, it will work very effectively. And um, then you'll have a pretty good site that you can work with to prepare your uh, ground for wildflowers. Okay, and the timing of this, it's good to do this in the summer. This is when the grasses tend to grow the most, of course, and it's when sunlight is, tends to be very important to them. So you can start this process as early as late May, but generally people do it around uh, mid-June and then they'll keep it covered, they'll keep it smothered for a few months into late August or early September. And at that point, when your time is up, you can go ahead and remove that cover off the grass and what you'll be left with is, it should be at least, uh, dead grass and pretty bare soil. And you'll be able to work pretty well with that when it comes to putting wildflower seeds into that. And like I just mentioned, you want bare soil as your result. And this will make it really easy to just incorporate the wildflower seedings. We'll talk about how you can go about doing that, but just know that that is the goal in mind. And then of course, no chemicals involved in this method it means it's safe for pollinators. This is one method you can use to transform a lawn into wildflower habitat. Another would be solarization though. And some of you may be familiar with this, but solarization basically entails overheating a lawn or basically cooking it to the point where the grass dies off. And after you complete this process, then you should be left with some workable soil. Of course, the downsides of this, it gets decently hot up here in Northern Iowa, but it may not be enough to kill the grass, especially if it's in a shaded area. So this probably won't work if you're trying to transform a piece of lawn that's really shaded. It really optimally works in a exposed area that doesn't have trees covering it. That's where it's perfect. And it's important to use clear plastic when you're doing this because you want the sun to go through. Um, unlike the previous example, smothering, where you want it to be dark, in this instance, you want it to be clear so you can cook that grass underneath. And in order to do so, you need clear plastic, not white plastic, but you need to allow the sun to go through and heat up the ground. And you're gonna wanna prepare the site similarly to the smothering method where you bury the edges of whatever you cover it with. In this case, it'd be clear plastic and then you weigh down the sides with rocks, <clears throat> excuse me, rocks or bricks, something along those lines, just to make sure the air doesn't go in. This is especially important because you want the temperature to really rise. It could potentially get over 100 degrees Fahrenheit under there. Uh, oftentimes though, it's over 80 degrees and that'll often be sufficient for killing the grass. But you, this is especially important. You don't want to let any air in to this. So solarization, it's another mechanical method chemical free. And again, similarly to smothering, the hottest times of year are gonna be great for this. Obviously you want that heat to enter into your covered area and kill off the vegetation underneath. So summer obviously is the best time to do this. Mid-June into September will work really well. 
you can remove the plastic in September. And this method, you can at least see what's kind of going on underneath a lot of times because it's clear plastic, so you don't have to remove it to necessarily see what's going on. You can kind of monitor it throughout the summer and just see how it's working. And again, the results, bare soil, which can easily be used to plant wildflower seedings in a lawn if you want to do this. Um, of course, these last couple methods are optimal for lawns or other areas covered in a grass or some sort of vegetation that you want to kill off. Wouldn't really be, you wouldn't need to do this if you were working with an agricultural field. You probably wouldn't need to do this in a woodland or anything like that, a forest. So this is optimal for lawns. These are good mechanical methods to use if you have a lawn where you want to plant some wildflowers and get a thick bloom of wildflowers. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss how you can go about preparing um, a bare soil, a patch of bare soil for wildflowers. And I will reference a lot of things that I recommend in my office because we often work with people, like I said, that come in with some sort of agricultural field and they want to seed some wildflowers in there. So I'll just discuss some of the ways in which you can go about doing that. Okay, so when someone comes into the office and they have a field, what they're gonna to wanna to do is minimize the seed bank that's existing already. And as some of you may know, underneath all of the soil exists a bunch of seeds. They may not be germinated, they may not be sprouted, but they're nonetheless there underneath the soil. And if they're, if they're disturbed in some way or following a harvest from a farmer or producer, um, the following season all these weeds may come up and they can, really, they can really make it difficult for a producer that's trying to grow a certain commodity. And the same is true for planting wildflower seeds. There's a seed bank that's often underneath a field. So you're gonna want to minimize that seed bank so it doesn't ruin your wildflower seeding. So tillage is a common way for people to do this. You'll often see people um, around here, they'll be out in their fields working in the fall or early spring. They'll have a tractor and they'll have a tillage attachment on the back and they'll be um, going through their field and tilling up their soil. The objective of this, of course, is to um, minimize the seed bank and minimize what it's going to do to their crop, but it's also useful for planting wildflower seeds. So if you have a larger field that you're working with, this is a good idea. Um, it can be a good method. Pesticide free, of course, it's mechanical, so it's beneficial in that regard. But the downside is that you lose some topsoil a lot of times, especially if it's a windy day. So it's not perfect. Some people dislike it, but it will work pretty effectively. Um, however, you may need to till a few times throughout the season. Um, and I'll preface by saying, in your first year of planting wildflower uh, seeds, you're not, pretty much the entire summer is gonna be dedicated to preparing the site. You're not gonna throw seeds out there and expect results immediately. It's gonna take basically the whole growing season for the first year just to prepare the site. So it'll be in year two that you finally get to see some results. We'll get to that, but pretty much know that the first summer is just dedicated to preparing your site. And um, that's what really needs to be done for optimal success in this case. All right, so timing of the tilling is important. You are gonna wanna do it early enough in the spring that you can then go back in a few additional times and do some additional passes after that. But the first tilling can be done April or May at the latest. That's generally a pretty good time to go about doing it. Um, and it's important after you do your first till, you'll get weeds come up and then you'll have to till again in all likelihood to eliminate those weeds. That's the objective. You don't want those weeds to go to seed because then you're just back at square one and that ruins all the progress that you've made already. So if you're tilling a field, just make sure you stay on top of the weeds. And don't let them go to seed. Okay, and if you're just working with a small area like that lawn that we discussed earlier, there are some tools that you can use where you wouldn't need a massive tractor, of course. 
Um, if you're feeling really ambitious, you can go out there with a garden hoe and disturb the soil that way. It simulates the same effect as a tractor with a tillage attachment. However, that's a lot of work, so kudos to you if you do that. Um, what's more practical, perhaps, is using a rototiller, which is a, just a little machine that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You can push it along and it churns up the ground. It's very effective for preparing an area for wildflowers and it does a, a very good job. So that's a good option for anyone working in a lawn, either a garden hoe, a rototiller, because a tractor with a tillage attachment is just a little bit of an overkill a lot of times in that case. So another thing that can be done instead of tilling, uh, a good alternative, and we talk about this a lot with um, NRCS agencies or FSA, is planting cover crops. Uh, cover crops are good, they have a lot of good functions, um, but it turns out one of those functions can be uh, being present and preparing an area for wildflower seedings because they, cover crops can really dominate an area for a growing season, so you can throw out some cover crop seeds for the summer growing season, just allow them to be out there, and they will pretty much suppress the weeds because they're gonna create a canopy that will shade out the weeds that would be in that field potentially. So they can be applied to a large scale field, they can be applied to a lawn if you're working with that. They're good options, uh, they're pretty economical, and they also have some benefits to them in addition to suppressing weeds because they can often fix nitrogen into your soil and other important nutrients like that. So planting cover crops is another good option for people to consider when preparing for wildflowers. And just quickly hitting on the why, I pretty much just went over it, but um, yeah, they shade, out the, the canop they shade out the weeds, provide a canopy, uh, cut off the sunlight, and they also have some benefits to the soil. So that's just quickly why cover crops are a good option for anyone who's interested in um, having something on their, their field over the summer instead of tilling. Okay, and... If you have the cover crop, if you have mm -hmm. a few weeds coming through, how do you, what's the best way to take care of the weeds so you, you know, they don't go to seed again? Yeah, so you're, you're asking if the, before you plant the cover crop, if weeds are already present, how do, how do you... If they happen to come through before it gets covered. Yeah, in that case, um, there's a few things you can do. You could try to till quickly before you planted the cover crop. You could do a quick till, and then you could throw some cover crop seeds on there in, say, April or May. That probably would be a good way to go about it. Um, just do a, a quick till and then the ground is ready, just throw the cover crops on. That way you can eliminate any weeds that are already there and the cover crops will hopefully take pretty well. Um, otherwise you could try spraying the area. Um, of course we talked about the downsides of that, but it would potentially be pretty effective in, in uh, combating some of those weeds. You could give it a quick spray with several different uh, herbicides and suppress the weeds that way. And then you could go in with cover crops that are um, not going to be impacted by whatever you sprayed and and try to establish them that way. Um, but it can be tricky working out the timing for sure. Um, and weeds are very persistent. You're probably going to have weeds either way, but cover crops will minimize them generally as much as you possibly can do so without spraying or tilling or anything like that. So like I just mentioned, spring is a good time to plant them because you want them to be present over the summer. So you could plant them in April, May at the latest, like mid-May. Probably don't want to do much later than that because you want them to be established on your field throughout the summer. And um, it may be a good idea to till beforehand and then you can spread your cover crop seeds. Um, but you can leave them throughout the summer and then after the summer's done, then they may die off or you could harvest them, whatever. That's another benefit. You could potentially harvest whatever cover crop you have on your field. So. They're very beneficial, very versatile, and they have a lot of good functions. So I would uh, encourage people to look into that as an option, potentially. And then in terms of the how of planting cover crops, there are definitely some fun choices. Some may not be too feasible for different people, but uh, the seeding drill, using a seeding drill is the most common. It's like an attachment that you can drag behind a tractor of some type, and you basically, dump a seed mixture into the drill, 
So you dump your cover crop seeds into the drill, and then the drill would plant them into the soil as the tractor pulls it along, basically, is how that works. That's a good option. I've worked with a couple people around here, even in Mason City, that have seeded part of their lawns with a seeding drill. With wildflowers, you can also use it, and we'll get to that, but it works well with cover crops too, so that's a good choice. Um, there's also different devices called interseeders and high clearance sprayers as well would even work. And for those who are very adventurous and ambitious, they can fly it on with an airplane or a helicopter if they have the means to do so. The rates for that are, they can be decently affordable, surprisingly, but um, probably not going to be as cheap as your other options on here. So, But it is very effective. You can cover a large area very quickly if you needed to seed like a large field with cover crops. But if you're just doing a lawn, you could even just distribute by hand. If you're just doing a, a small chunk of your lawn, you could just scatter seeds throughout your lawn that way. That'd probably be the best way to go about it for a small piece. But for the bigger pieces, these are some good options. And just quickly going over some popular cover crop species. When it comes to cover crops, a lot of people divide them into their legumes and their non-legumes. So legumes, they have a lot of benefits to them because they can fix nitrogen into the soil and that can make it very hospitable for your wildflowers that are to come. So that's something you may want to consider it may be beneficial to your wildflowers that will come later if you have a, uh, a legume cover crop in just to make that soil really optimal for them. Some good options are soybeans, cowpeas, red clover. They all work fairly well and they're all uh, rather abundant and they can create a thick cover that shields out the weeds. And then some non-legumes that people will commonly put on their fields. You have buckwheat, pearl millet, and sudan grass. Those are all some good ones. There are, of course, a lot more, but those are just some basic ones that I'm throwing out here. All right, so now we can talk about planting the wildflower seeds themselves now that we've discussed how to prepare the ground. And when it comes to planting wildflower seeds, fall is the best time to do it. You can do it in other, year, or other times of year. Winter is not really a good time, of course, because we'll have a, in most years have a snow cover. It's not the case this year really, but most years we will have snow and it's not optimal for the wildflowers to be planted at that time, of course, and summer is not a very good time either. It's just hard because there's a lot of stuff that's already growing in the soil at that point and it, the seeds just may not take very well. And if it's a dry year, then uh, it may be especially hard for them to establish themselves. So fall is a very good time to do it. And if you think about Iowa's historic conditions, we were a state that was primarily prairie, so every fall the weather would cool and the wildflowers would drop their seeds in the prairies and then they would uh, go through a stratification process is what it's called, where they basically freeze over the winter. The stratification process helps wildflowers to germinate really well the following spring. So that's, that's one of the reasons it's best to plant them in the fall so they can be cold in the winter and that'll actually help them to thrive the following spring if they go through that process. Um, and you can throw them out in the spring and have decent success. However, fall is really the optimal time and specifically um, like mid-September through much of November. You can even go a little bit into December for seeding. That's really a good time to do it. When you are planting wildflower seeds, something to be in mind, or something to keep in mind rather, is that you will probably need a carrier. And when I say a carrier, I'm talking about something that's gonna help those wildflower seeds get to their destination, which is within the soil. And if you think of a wildflower seed, some of you may have held some before or are familiar with them. Some of them can be very, very tiny. And those tiny seeds, when you're trying to spread them throughout where you want to establish them. They can often get lost. They can blow in the wind because they're so tiny. So just putting them out there by themselves, you may lose a lot that way. And that's why whenever a client wants to come in and plant wildflower seeds, we recommend that they get some sort of carrier uh, within their seed mix to help the seeds arrive at the intended destination, which is a, of course in the soil. And some carriers that we often recommend, some cheap ones, some accessible ones. We have sand, 
We have rice holes and we have vermiculite. All three of them work very well. All three are very accessible. When you go to a seed house like Albert Lee Seed House, they should all have this maybe already pre-made within your seed mix, but if not, you can add it pretty easily. And like I said, very accessible and affordable. So it's just good to throw that in because without them, your wildflowers may have a hard time establishing themselves in the ground just because they're so petite and they weigh just barely anything at all. So they can easily be blown around without the carriers. And when you are preparing to seed a tract of land, you will need to combine the wildflower seeds with the carrier. A good way to do this is just taking a five gallon bucket if you have a decent sized amount of seeds. Uh, otherwise, if it's a small piece of your lawn, you can just take like a gallon bucket or a small pail of some sort, small bucket. And what you can do is you'll want to um, start with your carrier in the container you want to add a little bit of water just to moisten that carrier, and then you can mix that up a little bit, and then you can throw your seeds in there, your wildflower seeds. And when you do that, when you add that water and you create that sort of environment, it helps the seeds to stick to the carrier, and that way they'll combine very well. They won't just keep separated among themselves within the container. That's really the optimal way of doing it. And People who do that do it this way generally have very good success. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're preparing your wildflower seeds. Okay, and when you want to, if we just take a lawn for instance, that's a lot of times what people want to do. A lot of people don't have a massive agricultural field to work with, so we can all probably relate more easily to just a small parcel of our lawns and when you want to put that into wildflowers, what you can do, you want to wear latex gloves generally or something where the wildflower seeds won't stick to your hands because you can easily spread them with your hands. You don't need a special machine if it's just a, an acre or less um, piece of land that's very manageable for people to just go out, walk the land and spread the seeds. It's pretty easy to do, but like I said, wear some sort of gloves so you're not having the seeds stick to your hands. Um, and then you'll just want to grab like a, a handful of seeds and kind of distribute um, a sweeping motion kind of with your hand. You can spread the seeds that way. You just want to keep track of where you go on your land. You can just make a couple passes and you can see the land pretty easily that way for free. That's a good way to do it. However, there are also hand crank spreaders. A lot of people may have used them for fertilizer for their lawn. You kind of just crank along, you put like the fertilizer in a little box and then you just crank it along. and you can walk and it'll spread out that way. Same thing works for wildflower seeds. So if people have those hand crank spreaders already, that's a good means of spreading wildflower seeds. And of course, if you have a larger field, it's not gonna be practical to go out and walk the whole entire thing. That's just tedious, it's cumbersome, and it'll take forever. So you'll wanna, a lot of times what people do, um, producers, farmers, they'll get some sort of attachment to their tractor that they can pull. I mentioned earlier a uh, seed drill, and this is very simple to use really, because all you have to do is you have to load your seeds into the drill, and you just drive your tractor along, and the drill will incorporate the seeds into the ground. Makes it very smooth, very easy that way. So that's uh, generally how people seed a larger tract of land. There are other methods, but this is generally the, the easiest and um, most accessible way to do that. And then there's also uh, spin or oscillating spreaders I have here on the slide. That's something that isn't used too much, but basically the premise of that is instead of directly seeding into the ground like a drill does, it kind of just flings the seeds and they will get where they need to go, but it's maybe not quite as efficient. But that is another method that can be used. Okay, and once you have the seeds into the ground in any environment, whether it be an agricultural field or your lawn, even a woodland, you'll wanna roll the seeds. Um, and what that entails basically is the purpose of a roller, excuse me, is ensuring that the seeds get good contact with the soil because if you just throw them out by hand, then they may not get down into the ground and 
grow roots the next spring like they need to do because they're just sitting there on the surface. So a roller basically just comes through. Uh, you can attach to the back of a tractor very easily. I would imagine they also make ones you can push, um, just a tiny little thing that you can push across your lawn. Um, but most of the time you'll see people put on the lawnmower or a tractor and they can just drive and it'll flatten out the, the lawn a little bit or the ground and just kind of bury the seeds a little bit more. And this ensures that they're able to, uh, like I said, uh, germinate next spring. So rolling the seeds, it's not essential, but it does certainly help them to germinate the following spring. So it's not a bad idea for people to consider. Okay, and now we'll talk about some wildflower maintenance once they've established. This is a topic that I'm sure a lot of you are interested in and I certainly get a lot of questions about it. So we'll go over what to do in order to maintain an optimal wildflower field with good density, good diversity year after year, because they definitely change a lot throughout years. You can have a really nice looking field one year, then the next year it may look completely different, very minimal diversity. We'll talk about how we can make sure the diversity always stays really good. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of lay out a 10 year plan here for managing a wildflower field. We often in NRCS offices write 10 year contracts for anyone interested in CRP or other conservation programs. And we'll talk more about those programs a little later, but um, I'll just lay out a 10 year time frame here for managing a wildflower field. And so in your first growing season, we kind of uh, talked about the first season already. Uh, so this slide's gonna talk about year two, but just to recap, the first season, just preparing the ground don't expect to get any good wildflowers the first year because you're not even gonna plant them until the fall. So really the first point which you can expect wildflowers is the following spring slash summer. So we'll talk about that here. And initially you're gonna expect maybe some really good results, but realistically the weeds are gonna dominate that seeding initially just because if you think about a plant's growing cycle, when you look at a weed, they wanna grow as quickly and efficiently as possible. And when you consider a wildflower, they're gonna be around for a few years. A lot of times they're gonna be perennial, so, or at least biennial a lot of times. So they are gonna establish a root system in that first year, but they're not gonna grow above ground a ton. So weeds are usually gonna dominate your seeding the first year. Don't panic if this is the case because this is what happens to most people. What you can do to mitigate the impact of the weeds is you can set them back in the middle of summer um, and this can easily be done by just mowing. So if you have your little plot of land in your yard, then you can just go through and say early or mid-June for the first time, you can mow it. You wanna mow maybe three or four inches off the ground so you can set your mower to that. And this will just allow light to come through and this will be beneficial for the wildflowers because they're not really gonna be that tall. When you mow, you're probably not gonna really chop many wildflowers up because they're gonna be so short. You will get the weeds and it'll be effective for that. But generally the wildflower is gonna be safe from mowing because they're just so short that um, it allows the sunlight when you mow, the, the sunlight can come in and help them to grow more. You'll wanna mow a couple times throughout the summer probably because the weeds will grow back so you can mow early to mid-June, and then July at some point, and then late July, early August. That's pretty ideal. All right, so the second growing season, so year three of your 10-year wildflower process is when it starts to get exciting because you'll be able to reap some of the rewards that you have sown both literally and figuratively in the previous years because the wildflower is gonna to start to look really good in the third year generally, because you work to minimize the weeds the following year, or the previous year, excuse me, and then in this year, the wildflowers should be able to outcompete them because they have the roots established, they have a little bit of a head start on the weeds, they should come up, they should look really good, and this is when landowners generally are very excited about what they've started. And also around this time, you may have some trees or shrubs that start to appear. Um, of course, you can do whatever you want with them, but within my offices, we tell people that it's ideal to manage those early and often 
because you're probably all familiar with cottonwoods, willows that can grow very well in a lot of our soils around here. And in an open area like a wildflower seeding, it's a prime environment for them to grow up and thrive. So it's not unlikely that you will have to deal with some trees or shrubs that come up. That's okay, it's expected. When it happens though, it's good to remove them because if you let them go for a few years, they can get taller than you very quickly and very easily. And then it just becomes a pain in the butt to manage them. So when you first see them, uh, that's you know usually the best time to, to manage them. That's what I usually recommend to people and it'll definitely save you a headache in the future. So you can keep that in mind. Same goes for weeds. If you see any weeds, deal with them early and often and remove the seeds from the environment by getting them before they go to seed. That's the best strategy. So get a quick drink here. Now in your fourth year, you want to keep doing what you've been doing. There's not really a ton of developments you can make at this point. In the following slides, we're going to talk a little bit about, a little bit about disturbance um, to the wildflower tract and how it benefits it. Uh, and when I say disturbance, I mean fires or grazing or mowing even. This can all be beneficial to wildflowers. We'll talk about that a little more very soon. You can start to do some of these disturbance acts in year four. You don't need to necessarily start this early, but at this point you may see some of your wildflowers. Um, they're probably gonna be really speciose and really diverse the previous year. This year their, their diversity may decline a little bit, but you still should have some good species within your collection of wildflowers. So just uh, keep doing what you've been doing at this point. However, in years five and six, you will probably want to disturb your wildflower seeding with some sort of activity that I've mentioned here because when you disturb it, it helps to reset all of the diversity, helps to reset the whole seed bank and whatnot because when you get a few years in, some species just start to dominate your seeding. So you may have a couple species that are prolific within your planting, but you may not have all the species coming through that you want to and burning it, mowing it, grazing it with some sort of large animal can all help the wildflowers to thrive in the following years. So that uh, you wanna do this in years five and six. And one consideration, if you have a little lawn, then you can just do the whole thing at one time. If you're gonna burn it or mow it or whatever, you can just do it all at once. But if you have a larger field, it may be good to just do half of it one year, half the next. This just kind of helps the insects and other small animals that are within the field because it still leaves them with half of the field where they can seek refuge and you're not just destroying all of it in one year because that kind of kills off a lot of your beneficial insects and whatnot if you do decide to burn the entire thing in one year. But ultimately, the pros of burning probably outweigh the cons. It also eliminates trees and whatnot when you burn, so a lot of benefits to it. All right, and the seasons after you've burnt, so your years seven and eight, you just kind of want to keep doing what you've been doing in the previous years, just removing any trees that come up, removing any weeds like thistles and whatnot before they go to seed. Otherwise, pretty simple, just continue on with what you've been doing. And then by the time you get to the end of the 10 year cycle, nine and 10, maybe time to disturb it again because you may again at this point see that you're diversity starting to decline. So generally people recommend a burn or a mow or a grazing every three, four, five years, maybe six, but at six you're really pushing it. Your diversity is probably gonna be pretty low at that point. So I would generally say anywhere from three to five years, it's good to burn it or to mow it or to graze it. So you may at the end of your cycle, 10 year cycle, um, find that it's time to do this once again. You're saying Burning it, so mm -hmm. isn't like you see everybody's burning now. Just to burn it like early in the spring here now, right? Well, yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna talk more about the specifics of that, but the best time to burn this would be a little bit early for for wildflowers because we still haven't even had a ton of grasses that have come up. Um, and when you burn, you're gonna want to set back 
any of the the weeds and the non-native grasses that you that aren't really desirable within your stand. So the optimal time, is what I tell people, is generally from April 1st all the way into early May. That's generally like the prime time for burning. Um, for some, it is convenient to burn right now because the conditions are really good. And if you don't have time later in the year, that certainly works. You can burn right now if the conditions are good. Um, a spring burn, though, in general, that's just going to do you a lot of good. So, But then another thing, um, if you're trying to manage trees and shrubs and weeds with your burn, you think a lot of the trees don't start to bud out and start to get their leaves until later in the spring. You're not going to expect to really see any trees with buds leafing out right now. So you're not going to do as much damage to the trees as you would if you burn later when they have their buds, because that's when they have ex they've expelled the most energy and they're the most vulnerable. So April into early May is the best time to burn, is what I say, because that'll really, uh, really knock back the trees that you might have on your wildflower patch. But good question. We talked about partitioning the fields and the benefits of doing a half or a quarter or a third, what have you. Um, generally a third or more in a certain years can be pretty beneficial. Um, but uh, like I said, you preserve a lot of your insects and your small animals if you don't burn or graze or mow the entire thing in one year. All right, so I've talked a lot about fire. It's intimidating to some people, but it is a very good tool for managing prairies and wildflowers. Because again, going back to Iowa's natural history, Iowa was a state where fires often ran through the prairies and they would get started by lightning. They would get started by other weather-related events. Native Americans started them as well uh, just to clear out vegetation. And they also did it because it helped the plants to green up really well the next spring. So there were a lot of reasons that fires were started, but it's undeniable that they occurred in Iowa's natural landscape. And they, although they're intimidating, can be a very beneficial tool that we can use at our disposal. So there are a couple times a year that are optimal for wildflower uh, burning. And I lay out here the spring and the fall. Like I mentioned, spring is what I recommend is the best time for wildflowers. However, that can change depending on if you have a lot of grasses within your wildflower planting because Come fall, if you have a bunch of grasses that you want to knock back, if you burn it in the fall, um, that'll really, it'll have more of an impact on the grasses um, and it'll help promote the wildflower diversity by just clearing out like the duff is what it's called, the understory. So that can be a case where fall is good. Otherwise, I tell people to burn in the spring because that's kind of like we talked about the spring is good because it can really harm the trees the most during that season. So that I, I tell people April 1st to May 10th, generally, that's a good window to burn. May 5th, you know, May 10th is pushing it a little bit, but early May is good. Okay, and another, this is more manageable for people if they aren't really in the idea of burning, especially if they have just a little itty bitty wildflower patch in their lawn. They probably don't want to go through the trouble of burning all that because that would be kind of overkill a lot of times. So they can simply just mow it. Mowing kind of simulates the effects of burning. It doesn't do quite as good of a job, but with a burn, you're really eliminating that vegetation to the ground layer. You can essentially do the same thing with mowing. You just have to put your mower at a low enough level and just mow as short as you can. And um, this can be done in the fall and spring, just like burning. If you do it in the fall, uh, try November 15th, like mid-November until as long as you can go into the winter because at this point in the fall, pretty much everything is dormant anyway. So it's a good time. And in the spring, same window approximately is as you're burning uh, April to early May. Can be beneficial to remove excess vegetation as well, like the grasses and whatnot when you, when you mow in the spring if you're doing it because then wildflowers will come up easier, they'll get more sun. And when they're covered in grass clippings, it's harder for them to get sun and, and, uh, and thrive that way. Okay, and then there's grazing. This is a fun option. It's one that the DNR uses on a lot of their lands. Uh, and what they do, they often will put goats or sheep 
out on their land, sometimes cattle as well. And again, going back to Iowa's natural history, I often talk about this, but I just like to reference it when I'm uh, working on wildflower plantings or prairie plantings because it's good to mimic the natural cycles of what would have occurred in Iowa. We used to have a lot of bison in Iowa. They would have uh, simulated the effects that cattle have on the land, and therefore you can use cattle grazing to uh, kind of thin out your wildflower patch. They can, and it really depends on your objective, because if you just want to do like uh, go in and get the grass as short as possible, the flowers as short as possible, then cattle, a bison, and horses are all good because they have evolved to eat grass specifically, whereas goats and sheep, they have evolved to eat more broadleaf plants, which means like flowers and perhaps trees and shrubs. If you have a tree and shrub problem, then goats are great, or sheep. That's why the DNR often puts a lot of uh, goats and sheep on their grounds that they're managing their public lands because we have tree problems on a lot of those, and goats do a pretty good job of going in and thinning out some of those trees. So if you have the means or you know someone that could use a place to put their cattle for the summer or just a week or two, and you have some wildflower ground that you want to allow them to access, it can be mutually beneficial. You want to avoid disturbance during the primary nesting season. When I say the primary nesting season, I mean this is the time in which most birds or reptiles or amphibians, insects even, are nesting within your prairie or your wildflower habitat. And you just don't want to disturb. There's no law against it, but it's just a regulation that I advise to people because you would hate to have a bunch of birds or, or bees or whatever in your planting in the middle of summer and then go in and burn it because you would be killing all the babies and whatnot that can't really fend for themselves at that point. So generally you're going to want to avoid doing anything in the summer. You can mow sometimes if you have a tree problem, just like go in and just mow the specific problem area. Well, you'll generally want to avoid doing a lot of this during the summer because you're just going to end up killing a lot of animals and, and insects, unfortunately, if you do that. So spring or fall is the best time. And this is just a quick recap of the 10-year plan for managing for wildflowers. We talked about all this already, so I won't spend too much time on it, but just know that your first year you're not gonna have many results. And in the following years, you'll start to get better and better results, but then it'll kind of plateau and the diversity will go down. At that point, you should go in with fire, with grazing, something along those lines mowing as well and that'll disturb the ground and facilitate better growth of wildflowers and that would be really the optimal thing to do and then your diverse diversity will increase again and then four or five years later plateau once again and the cycle repeats you disturb again so on and so forth you can keep maintaining a ground that way and your diversity will stay very good that way All right, so here are some of our native wildflower stars, as I call them, because we put these in so many of our plantings for the NRCS. And we, I had addressed a question earlier about what <laughs> flowers I should plant or what flowers someone should plant if they're interested in putting stuff out there in a wildflower garden. These are all good ones because they were all native species to Iowa, and we often recommend them in our uh, plantings that we give out at the USDA, our seed plantings. So any of these would be excellent. Uh, bees love wild bergamot. It's nicknamed bee balm. And I'll be out in the fall when it's prolific and I'll just see bees and other pollinators swarming all over it. So that's always very exciting. It smells fantastic. So I love that one. But any of these other ones are terrific. Of course, uh, butterfly weed, otherwise known as butterfly milkweed. It's one of our milkweed species in Iowa and milkweed gets a lot of press for being the host plant for monarch caterpillars, of course, so that's a great one to put out there as well. The flowers are really pretty and orange on that one, and they attract a lot of pollinators too. And then all these other ones, New England Aster, Stiff Goldenrod, Mountain Mint, uh, they have flowers of varying sizes, and they're all excellent. One thing to consider, and I'll talk about this a little more soon, but it's good to it's good to have flowers that bloom during different growing seasons. 
There are some flowers that only bloom in the spring, some only bloom in the summer, some only in the fall. It's good to have some of each in your mix um, on whatever property you're seeding with wildflowers because this, uh, this just ensures that you have flowers blooming at all times of the year. Here are some trees for bees. There's not a ton, but trees are often underappreciated for their purposes of functioning for pollinators. But here's a few that are just some good ideas. Any fruiting tree, as many of you are aware, produces some nice flowers, good fragrant smell. Pollinators generally like them pretty well. So apples, pears, crab apples, cherries, anything like that. They all work very well for pollinators. And then same with linden, uh, otherwise known as basswood. That's a good one. The flowers are tiny, but they do a good job and pollinators seem to like that pretty well. So these are some good options if you're looking for trees for bees. And then some shrubs for pollinators. I'm sure many of you are familiar with elderberries. They are prolific around here. They often come up in our ditches and they can even be a nuisance at some point. However, the berries are great food for wildlife and the flowers are tremendous for bees and other pollinators. So I definitely have a soft spot for it, although some people don't like it as much. Choke cherry, service berry, also good options. Pictured here as an elderberry flower though, and I'm sure it's very recognizable to many of you. I'll quickly run through some invasive species to avoid, avoid rather, because there are some in Iowa that may look very pretty, but you don't really want to have them on your property because they will potentially take over. Um, and although they look nice, it may be hard to remove them once they're established. So I would avoid these species if possible. First being purple loosestrife. There's a lot of this that grows kind of over by Pilot Knob and it's established pretty well over there. So it's in our area for sure. You just have to keep an eye out. It looks really nice, but it's very dominant and it can take over. Canada thistle, pretty undesirable. Of course, it's very spiky and unpleasant in that regard. Bees do like it a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, it's nice, but I just wish it weren't so invasive because I'll be out in the field in the summer and I'll see Canada thistle blooming and you don't want that because then it's gonna go to seed and the seeds are gonna get everywhere. But I do commonly see bees and other pollinators on the flowers. So it's not the worst and it is technically native in some parts of Iowa, but you generally don't want that in your, in your planting. Dame's Rocket is another. We don't have a ton of them around here. They are present in, in some, uh, some areas though. So just watch out for that. And Honeysuckle, it's a shrub, uh, smells great. And it's super prolific, can establish anywhere. I'm sure we have a bunch out here at Lime Creek in the understory of woodlands. They're about the first thing to green up in the spring in the woodlands and the last thing to lose its leaves in the fall. And Pollinators like it, but when you have that on your property, it's going to be really hard to remove it because it gets really thick in a forest understory. So best to avoid it. Okay, and then I will talk about some of the programs that we offer through NRCS or USDA, uh, even DNR. We have some things that we recommend to people. So if you find that you are interested in planting wildflowers on your land, then these are some of the programs that may be good for you. And of course, the first is CRP. It's very well known. Uh, it's got great name brand, so people everywhere are pretty familiar with it. We have a bunch of CRP ground around here uh, in Cerro Gordo and, and Hancock counties and North Winnebago. Just a bunch of people are interested in this program. Some things to know about it, uh, generally 10 to 15 year contracts is what you're gonna be signing up for. So it's a decent commitment but we in our offices, the USD offices, will help you through the paperwork and getting set up and whatnot with the seeds that you need. And then any questions that you have throughout, we're happy to answer. Um, but there are some eligibility requirements that have to be met. Someone needs to have owned the land for more than a year before putting it into CRP. And it must be farmland, meaning uh, cropped between four of the last six years between 2022 or 2012 and 2017 if you're putting it in this year. Generally the payment uh, pays an annual rate of less than $300 an acre, can be up to that, but then there's also some sign-up incentives. So people generally get a decent amount of money in their first year because they get some bonuses for signing up. Um, but then you can expect annually to make about $300 or less per acre. Uh, generally around here, people get about 
anywhere from 200 to 260 or 70 per acre. So not bad if the ground isn't useful for farming or, or otherwise. And then we cost share the payment um, for the purchase of the seeds and whatnot as well. And then specifically within CRP, there's a few programs that people may want to look into. First being CP25, otherwise known as Rare and Declining Habitat Restoration. So with this one, um, creates a pretty diverse mix of flowers because at least 10 flowers have to be planted for the requirements to be met and five grasses. It's good for people that want both grasses and wildflowers. However, if you're mainly interested in the wildflowers, then we have some other ones that may be a bit better for you. The next one is the uh, Gaining Ground for Wildlife. This is a good one, very popular around here. Uh, people often put their ground into this one to create pheasant habitat, but pheasants happen to love wildflowers for, their, for raising their, their chicks, and uh, there's a lot of overlap between people who are interested in pheasants and then people interested in having wildflowers. The benefits are pretty similar in both cases. Um, this program in particular creates a nice mosaic of both wildflowers and grasses within the landscape. Uh, and again, if you want both grasses and wildflowers, this is another good one to consider. However, if you're mainly interested in wildflowers, then this one is a good program for you, uh, the pollinator habitat. Minimum of 10 wildflowers and like I mentioned earlier, they have wildflowers that bloom, acquire, rather they have a requirement for wildflowers that bloom in the spring, summer, and fall. They're, that way you don't have a season in which you don't have any wildflowers present. This ensures that they're present throughout the season. It's good for the pollinators that way because then they're never deprived of their flowers throughout the, the busy season. And then uh, we have our prairie strip, similar to the uh, pollinator habitat I just mentioned. This is better for just a tiny chunk of land though, rather than a big field. So if you have a tiny piece you wanna put into CRP, that's a good one. I'll quickly run through EQIP. We have, um, again, this is, the eligibility requirements aren't quite as strict for this because you can put forest land into it, you can put pasture, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be cropped. And if it's adjacent to a waterway, it doesn't have to be cropped either and it can be put into this. This is a decent thing to consider. So with EQIP, we can help cost share and we pay an annual rental payment as well for this. Uh, we can help cost, cost share setting up uh, pollinator habitat or waterway, prairie strip. It's very versatile, there's a lot of options. It's a good thing to consider. And lastly, we have the Prairie Partners Program. This is a good one. I helped someone over on the east side of Mason City. Actually, they enrolled in this and that was kind of a fun one. They didn't have farm ground, so this is a good workaround because the land doesn't have to be farmed to be eligible. So this would probably be most uh, pertinent to people in this room potentially because although there's no annual payment, we do help cost share. Um, we as in like the DNR as a fund for this, we help cost share about 50% of the seed purchase. Uh, so if you're interested in purchasing wildflower seeds to go over a property, then you can partner with Prairie Partners and we will help you pay for 50% of the, the purchase of those seeds. So that is uh, a good one to consider just for anyone who doesn't have agricultural land. Wrapping up, so that's all I've got. Um, like I said, I'm more of a bird guy. So if you ever have any bird inquiries, I do have this website, which I'll shamelessly plug. So if you ever have any bird inquiries you need to look up, you can check out my website. And if you ever have any inquiries about uh, starting a wildflower planting on your property, you can just come up to me after this and I can give you my phone number and you can reach out. I can help you uh, when I'm at work one of these days and I can help you with advice or, or planning or whatever you have uh, related to wildflowers. So with that, are there any questions for me? Do you have an email address or something too? I do have an email address and... Sounds great. Yep, I've got an uh, email address for both DNR and NRCS, so you can feel free to reach out with either one, and I can get back to people with those. So, yeah, I can certainly uh, help anyone that's interested in uh, establishing wildflowers on their ground because I deal with these questions a lot in my work, so I'm pretty experienced with it at this point. Question? Shade tree wildflowers. Shade tree. Shade. 
Which ones work the best? So if they're like under a forest canopy or something? Under, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a little trickier. We don't generally, uh, in my offices, have people that can really put stuff into programs like that because it's not cropped, obviously. Um, but stuff that can work in the shade, there's native Iowa flowers that are uh, evolved to grow in the shade because if you look out at our landscape, we have like oak savannas, like these big Baroque trees, and there's a lot of flowers that uh, evolved to grow up under those. Um, so shade, like species that are like partially shade tolerant will be good. Bee balm actually works decently well, as does milkweed in those. Um, those are both pretty decent. Um, otherwise, you could try uh, Black-Eyed Susan. That's a good one for shade. Um, and some of the cone flowers do pretty well. And Golden Alexanders and Stiff Goldenrod are all very good in those. Um, I can get you a list as well uh, in the subsequent days if you were interested in, in shade tolerant flowers in particular because not a lot of people ask about those, but I can certainly uh, get you a, a more detailed list if you were interested. Any other questions? Yes? If for the prairie partners, the same way they would help with the cost yeah. of seed, do they also help with the um, equipment? We can, uh, oh, like, like cost sharing the equipment? Well, like, or just finding it? Or finding it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a couple pastures that we yeah. Definitely. You know, I don't have a seed drill. Yeah. Or yeah. The the uh, person that I helped on the east side of Mason City, they actually got a, a seed drill from here, from Lime Creek. So I, apparently there's one here that can be used. They Lime Creek either brought it over to their place or she went over and got it from here. Can't remember how that exactly worked, but they do have one here apparently. So it seems that they're willing to let people use it if if you need. So that would probably be the, be the most easy and accessible. Otherwise, I have a huge contractor list in my office of people that can do the service as well for you. And I can't recall if Prairie Partners helps with the, uh, the, per the cost of like having a contractor come in or if it's just with the seed cost. I wanna say just the seed price cost sharing, so we pay for half of that, but I may be wrong and maybe we'd be pleasantly surprised, but um, yeah, I would first check here, I guess, with Lime Creek if you needed help with any of that, with a seed drill. Um, otherwise, I'd be happy to distribute a, a list of people that could do it if, if Lime Creek can't. No problem. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for letting me come and chat with you. And if you want my contact information, I'll write it down somewhere, my email, my phone number. Um, and if you have any questions you want to ask me not in front of the group, I can also address those. So thank you all. I think, Connor, we had, I know Madison had your email address up for our, when we sent it out for your, awesome. for today's meeting. So I'm pretty sure it was on there. Right, look here. I'm pretty sure it was on there. It was on there already, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah. Iowa DNR. Perfect. Yep. So it's already, it's already on our Madison put out for their uh, B Club meeting today. So Perfect. that information's on already too, so. Feel free to reach out anytime to that email address and I will definitely be happy to work with any of you. Anything else then for Connor before we... Okay. All right. Uh, one other thing I'm gonna talk about here uh, are summer meetings. Uh, we're going to do our, our June one. We're, we're trying to stay with our same Tuesday nights, but our June one, I'm going to change it to the first Tuesday in June because the second Tuesday in June, I am on vacation up in northern Minnesota fishing. So, <laughs> well, you can if you want. It's, it's about a seven hour trip, but yeah, we can do the meeting up there if you want. <laughs> Sit out in a boat and discuss the meeting and pull, pull a few fish in at the same time. But, uh, the June on one, we're going to be moving that to June 4th. So it'll be the first Monday. But our June, our meetings in the summer, let's see, July would be the 9th. And then we go to September. We don't do the August meeting because of honey extracting, state fair, stuff like that. And then September would be the September 10th. So that would be our meeting. So uh, last year we had Madison Rao host the first one. We had Sue Yurk host the second one, and we had Riley Finer do our September one. Riley showed about his extracting process. Uh, that was pretty interesting. We had a, quite, a, quite a number of people at each one, 
So if we can come up with three more people this year that would like to host our summer meetings, uh, we got to go to their places, look at their bees, go in their beehives, check it out, talk about different things they have, what they can do, what's going on, uh, what they can do to improve their hives or you know situations. So uh, I think it went really well last year. So if we can get uh, three more people to host this year, that would be great. So if you, uh, if you want to host one, just get a hold of me uh, and uh, we'll pick a day and pick one of them days and stuff like that and see if it'll work. So uh, I think that's all I got here on this part of it here. Uh, I'm going to stop in. Uh, for those of you who knew Rick Levenhagen, he only passed away back in December here. I haven't got a chance to talk to his wife yet, but uh, he always had a fireworks show around the 4th of July time. It, it was, we, had a, we had a bee meeting out there too several years ago. Uh, and he is, I know he's planning on for his going away, basically he's, they're doing a big fireworks show. And I'm sure we're probably invited, but uh, I, I don't know the dates or nothing like that. But uh, so if, those of you that knew Rick, uh, there's something probably going to be coming up here. Uh, I'll try to get a date and stuff like that if they, if they have anything set up yet. So uh, I stopped again the other day, but um, she wasn't around. So I haven't got a chance to get that done yet. So uh, is there anything else that needs to be brought up before we close for the day?